So some of the things that I want to demonstrate is going to be the positions of the light and just that whole rim light and whatnot. So can I have the silver reflector, please? All right, so here, or silver white, here is our main light in the photograph. And I'm going to take a photo. And so everybody take a look. Let's see, you look perfect. And I'm going to move it off just a tiny bit to the side. And uh, can we lower those lights just a tiny bit in the front? OK, everybody. So when I shoot this picture, what would you, this next one, what would you call that one? Going back to the thing. So I, I did this a little bit confusing for, on purpose, just like a little bit. Anybody? Like, what position would this be? OK, so here's the thing. This is why I'm saying this. If you look at this photo, technically, the shadow of her nose has not quite reached the shadow of her cheek. So technically, it's loop. And the point is, who cares? It doesn't matter. It's just as long as you can look at a photo and say, oh, OK, the shadow of the nose almost meets the shadow of the cheek. That's what I want you to know. Like, it's loop, but it's almost Rembrandt. So it doesn't matter. You just have to be able to see it. And that's what you're training your eye to look for, training your eye to look for the length of that shadow. OK, so here's the next thing. Can you bring that white in real, 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 real close? Perfect. OK, so here is where it can get a tiny bit confusing. If we take a look at this shot, the shadows are really filled in, and it becomes hard for somebody to tell really what the position of the light is. So what you'll be doing is training your eye to separate. You say, OK, the shadows, like if you look at the highlight, there's a highlight under her cheek there. So I know that there's a main light off to that side. I'm going to ignore the shadows first so I can figure out where that main light is placed. And then your next step will be, OK, I figured out my main light now. Let's go ahead and worry about the fill. All right, so that would be loop with a lot of fill light. Can I have silver from the back as a rim? All right, so the next thing to know is that rim lights can be lots of different things. Rim lights can be from strobes. On location, rim lights could be lights bouncing off of a wall. But a rim light can also be a reflector. And so in this case, what we're going to do is John can actually see it, or I think he can. You did it a second ago. Yeah, right there. Yeah. I th Wait, where is it this light? It's hard yeah. with uh, lots of overhead no, lights on. But what you can same. actually do if you're using your modeling lights is you can actually see the separation. So this rim light will make it so that side of her face doesn't blend in. So let me take another shot. All right. I've got, you'll see just a tiny bit of highlight right here on the side of her face. So you know something's got to be casting that, and you just have to figure out what. But that would be a rim light, or you can call it a kicker. The other thing that it could be is it could be a strip softbox. We're going to go through all of the different options of what it could be. So that's perfect. Let's give it a, a test right there. So here is another example of, oh. Different Fire. channel? Yeah. Channel one? Uh, let's see, channel set 8A. Oh, yep, that would be why. <laughs> Thank 1A? You. 1A is perfect. Okay. So now we've got a nice subtle rim light on the side. But I'm going to warn you although this class is intended, the, like the entire class, the point of the class is in the end. You look at a photo and figure out how it's lit. There are many, many instances where you won't be able to tell if it happened to be a reflector catching a ton of light or if it happened to be a strip softbox or whatever. But no one cares. The idea is that you can reproduce it. Like, that's the goal. It's you're not right or wrong if you're like, oh, I used a reflector, but it looks identical. It's more so if you use a reflector and go, man, it's not doing what I want. Let me try another option. Let's try a strip softbox. You could have a totally different setup. But if it looks the same, you've achieved your goal. It doesn't have to be identical. All right, so next thing down the line is so far I've demoed for you our main light here. That's our rim light or our kicker light. 
we had a fill card in the side. We had white to fill in the shadows. But let's take a look at adding a background light. Can you take this strip off of that? Um, you can just point any light at the background you want. You could, I mean, you, could, you can just blast it with a bare bulb, but it's a little bit harder to control. Uh, if you use a softbox, you could have a gradient across the background. But I wanted to introduce just something interesting that I use quite often called a grid. And grids are fantastic. And you'll see this at the end uh, for how you can use grids on the face. But grids are one of these things that tripped me up in lighting all the time when I first started to code light because I didn't know what they'd do. What grids do is they focus light in. Normally with a bare bulb, and if you guys uh, want to take a look at what that looks like on the background, uh, I'm going to have John take that grid on and off so you can see the difference. So right now you can kind of see the spread of light. Now I'll watch when the grid goes on. Okay, and I believe that one's a 20 degree grid, right, I think. 20. Okay, here's what you need to know about grids. Grids vary in size and how much spread of light they allow. So here's the rule that you want to keep in mind. The smaller the number the grid, the smaller the area it lights. So a very small number, like this one for example, this is a five degree grid. It's going to give me a very tight, narrow beam of light. However, if I switch to something bigger, this one it goes five, 10, and 20. Five, 10, and 20. So take a look here, and then we're just gonna switch it to the five. It is a tiny spot of light. So the reason that I wanted to introduce this to you early on is that as you look at lighting, I think a lot of us might be familiar with soft boxes and umbrellas, but these ones confuse me all the time because they give you little, little focused areas. Um, I recommend if you've never used grids to give them a try because they give you so much more control than any other modifier. Now, one other concept of lighting. We talked about hardness and softness of light. Can I put the, oh, it gets high. Yeah. Do, you have the, do you have the 20 still or no? Yeah, the 20's right here. Can I put that back on yeah. for a sec? Okay, one other thing to know in general with lighting is if you want to focus the light, if it's looking focused, one of the things you can do as well is move it. So watch what happens if he moves this light back further and further and further. It actually begins to spread out quite a bit. Now can you move it real close? The closer you bring the light, it starts to concentrate it. So how I often describe light, and I'm sure if anyone has seen me teach lighting class, you've heard this, is I describe light like bucket of water, like a bucket of water, because it behaves very similarly. And John, one day we were testing this and he let me splash water in his face to <laughs> demonstrate this. He's the one who suggested it, it was not me, so it was all him. Um, but how I can describe this is, if I were lighting you, and I've got my bucket of water, and let's say I throw it from back here. Throw my bucket of water. What happens is that water spreads out. So you'll get wet and you'll get wet. But y'all get kind of wet. You're not soaking wet because it kind of spread out. So for light, right, light spreads out and you're all, it's like a medium exposure, right? I take that same thing and I throw it right at her face. This is the birthday girl, so that's why she's getting the special treatment. Um, but I do the same thing. It's just going to light or get her face and her chest wet, but it'll be soaking wet. So the light will only hit here, but it'll be really bright. Now with grids, this is most defined, like you see this most, but the same thing happens with any modifier. It's just, this is where you'll actually see it the most. So if you're seeing like, man, they've really got that light just hitting one part of the body or there's just a spotlight on the background, it could be a grid or it could be a grid or another light source very close to focus the light. So that's another kind of sciencey thing about focus. The next thing, let me take one picture of this so we can get a background 
light on file. And so you're gonna turn straight back onto me, perfect. And can you angle it down just a little? Perfect, great. And maybe turn it to, let's try just like five two, like just turn up the power just a little. Uh, yeah, sorry for the gloves. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So this now gives her separation. So that's the difference of what you would get of a background light. So if I flip between the two of these, it's just taking a look between. No separation. She kind of starts to blend into the side. This is the difference if you have a rim light or a kicker light, and then this would be for your background light. So you're training your eye to see those things. Um, this can be used to make really graphic effects, and so I like to do that because I can carve the subject out from the background, especially if they have an interesting pose. Okay, um, here's another thing. Would you turn that one off for me? Um, another thing that you might want to add for science of light would be feathering your light. So you don't always just point the light straight at the subject. And this will make a difference to what the light looks like. Um, in this example, we probably won't see it too much. Uh, but let's say for this photograph, the way that it's angled here, the light, the shape of it here, it's wrapping around a little bit more. So I'll get a little bit more wrap to the side, but also where that light's pointed, especially if I just have it pointed straight at her, if you have a lighter colored background or if you're in a small space or you're close, your background's gonna get some light. I know that my first studio was tiny and I always struggled because I think it looks nice in that example when the background and the subject are lit differently. Like it's not just flat, not just throwing light at the situation. But in a small space, it's like, I take the shot and they all look like they're on the same plane. So one of the tools you can use is feathering the light. I can still have loop light on her face, but angle it so it's not quite hitting the background. So that would be something like moving the light off to the side and I can actually feather it. So it's still, I can still have that loop pattern, but now it's not even anywhere pointed at that background. So that may be another situation where you're in your studio and you're like, okay, They've got a nice dark background and loop light on the face, perfect, and you set it up and you're like, crap, my background is super light, what do I do? It may be something simple as changing the feather. So I'm gonna demo this, I'm gonna just move you back so I can get a little more spill here. Let's move back this way. All right, perfect, let's see how this goes. All right. Let's do first, can I? Oh, those are lowered. So what I'm looking at is when I look at the shape cast by her nose, I've got all of this light in the room that fills it in. This is why I try to darken everything down. But I'm, I'm, I'm seeing it. I'm getting some, uh, I'm seeing the loop light there. So let's take a look. Perfect. All right, so this is a non-tricky example of loop. She'll have just a little shadow of loop from her nose. It's not perfectly centered, but it's not going towards Rembrandt. But I've got kind of a light background. So now what I can do is I can try to angle it away, feather it off. And I can still have loop. And I can bring it a little bit more to the side if I need. So I can try to isolate the two. So let's take a look at these. So if you look at the difference between the two as I flip through these, and I know for you guys it might be a little difficult to see, it is completely different between the two because of feathering. Yes. But the shadow stays pretty much the same. When you feather like that, like mm -hmm. do you, how much power of the light do you, I mean, did you change the? <laughs> Good question. Um, so when I had the light not feathered, pointed towards her, What's happening is I'm, when I'm actually pointing it at her, I'm getting a little bit more of the center of the light. And the center of the light is going to be the brightest part. And this is kind of what John was talking about is in a light source, I mean, the head is only so big. 
Now it has a little bit of time, the bucket of water, it's got a little bit of time to spread out by the time it hits the end, but it's not going to completely fill the modifier. So you'll have that bright spot in the middle. There's a lot of portrait photographers and a lot of master photographers that I know, and this is not really exactly related to the science of light, that they don't ever point the center of the light at their subject because the edges are going to be softer. So you'll see a lot of people using soft boxes that are angled to the side for that reason. It just has a little bit smoother edges, whereas you're getting a little bit harder light in the center. Um, so going back to your question, is when I'm pointing at her face, because I'm getting that hot spot, it will be brighter. As I feather it away, there's less light hidden, or less light hitting her. And so you would have to make exposure adjustments. If you want to use a light meter, it would tell you exactly how much. And it might just be a third to two thirds of a stop. Kind of, kind of depends on the light and how much you move it and all that stuff. OK, so the next thing that I want to talk about is controlling your light. So let's say you're all at home. And I'm going to go through everything. I'm going to go through looking at all these photos and the catch lights and the shadows and whatever. And you're at home. You cannot get an example that I told you exactly how to do it. And you're saying, well, crap, what's wrong? If you are shooting in a small space with white walls, that is an equivalent of surrounding your subject with white fill cards on all sides. So if you use umbrellas, what umbrellas do is they toss light everywhere. So it's more like if I'm, instead of throwing a bucket of water at you, I'm throwing a pan. I take that pan and the water just, I have no control. That's, and that's a downside of umbrellas. What's great about them, you can get nice quality of light um, and they're cheap. That's fantastic. But you just lose that control. So if you're at home and you are trying one of these setups and you've got an umbrella or whatever it may be, and you've got white walls on either side, it's just like having white fill cards. So the actual better uh, way to have your space set up to be able to replicate something is actually to have black walls on all side. However, I find that if you have all black studio, you look like you're taking your subjects to a dungeon <laughs> and like they enter and they're looking around all confused. So instead what you can do is you can better control the light in your space by using foam core. So this is uh, one piece of foam core. You can get them all different sizes. Uh, what I use in my studio is something called V-flats. And V-flats are four by eight sheets pieces of foam core, black on one side, white on the other, and then you put them together and you tape them in the middle to make a V. So that's if I'm in a situation and I'm shooting this and what'll happen is right now I feathered my light. So I turned it to the side, but I've got a white wall right here. I mean, that's just, it's exactly like having a white fill card. So this is when it would be appropriate to flip it around and use the black side up against the wall. It's not that you need to bring it very, very close to her, but you're just trying to dampen some of that reflection. So this is one other thing to add into your list of improving your space to try to replicate something. Know that your environment will make a difference. Light colored walls, light colored ceilings, all of that. Um, where you can get V-flats is if in your town there is a th some kind of theater supply, they have them. So like, I mean, there's just a theater shop. Also, you can make your own, absolutely make your own from Home Depot. Also, any place that does large scale matting and framing. It's just pieces of foam core. Anything else I'm missing, John, for recommendations on those? No, sign shops. Sign shops, that's yeah. the other good one, yeah. right because they're using foam core all the time. So I recommend that, that you add that to your to-do list to have right away if you're trying to replicate things. Okay, so I just wanted to show an example. Can you give me a white wall and then we'll flip it? Okay, perfect. So this is your white wall, nice and close. And then if you've got your black V flat up. So there's with white walls. And there's when you flip it around, it's a huge difference. And especially when you are using, um, using soft boxes and feathering. And I'm gonna use that one more time. I'm gonna do one more thing. All right, here's another term that you would want to be familiar with. Something called a flag. Flagging light is blocking it off. You're blocking it off from hitting areas. So there may be an instance 
where you're lighting your subject and you're like, man, I've got my white wall right here and I can't, I, I don't have anything to block it off. And then, oh man, it's hitting the background. What you can actually do is you can actually use a, black, a piece of black fabric or a piece of black foam core. And when you hold it up like John's doing, it casts a shadow onto the background. So there might even be things like that in a photograph. You're like, man, they're getting their background much darker than me. How are they doing it? That could be one instance. So let me take a quick test of that. All right, and then can you do one without, John? Perfect. All right, let's see. So there's with and there's without. Huge difference between the two. So there is a lot you can do to control your light. All right, so the last thing that I want to do is I want to talk just a little bit more about your directions of light, right? A little bit more about that Rembrandt and moving the light around. Okay. So one of the things that you want to notice is that we've got a boom arm. Your life will be made a lot easier by having a boom arm. I the one that I use is the Avenger D600. Oh, it is. Ha! I'm so smart. <laughs> I, I knew a product name. <laughs> um, but anyway, so this is the one that I use at home. Uh, just a quick recommendation. The reason that you would want to do this is if it's just on the stand and you are trying to achieve paramount lighting, butterfly lighting, what ends up happening is to do so without a boom arm, the pole ends up directly in your way. You can't actually get it centered. So you want to have a boom arm because it lets you get the light directly out centered without the pole being in your way, which becomes even more important when you do full length shots. Um, so you definitely want a boom arm and making sure that you've got sandbags on your setups as well. Okay, so what I want to show you is taking a look at our Paramount light real quick. Make sure we're all set up. Okay, paramount light. I'm going to move the light far off to the side for our Rembrandt light. I'm looking for that little triangle. I'll move it up forward a little bit more, I think, there. Okay, get Rembrandt light. Perfect, so I've got a nice triangle underneath her eye. And if I turn her, I'm gonna have you turn just a little bit this way. If she turns this way, and there's a triangle, bring your chin back towards me a little bit, this would be broad lit Rembrandt light. Wider part of her face, the triangle is away from me. However, if I bring the light all the way back around here, and have you turn and face me. Great. Okay, good. And then bring your chin back this way. A little bit less, I'll tell you when, right there. This is Rembrandt in short light. And actually turn your chin towards me a little bit more. So what I'm watching is when that shadow meets. Right there, and do one tiny move to your right. Just a little bit, right there, perfect. Okay. So, moving the light back around to the side makes the face look a lot more narrow than just having it, let's see, fully illuminated. Let's bring those up. And if it'll load, there we go. So the difference between the two, a lot more shadows in this because there's more shadows towards the side of the face. But if you look at the shot and go, oh man, there is way, it's way too dark. I, I didn't want a, a shot that was so heavy. You can come in and bring in a reflector. Photomaker wants to know, uh, Lindsay, if we want to do a very pale post-processing for like a fashion-y look, mm -hmm. like you often do, does it matter how much shadow we're creating on subjects with our lights? Okay, good question. Um, I find that usually I can get 
more of that even pale look when I have a lower contrast image with less shadows. It doesn't mean that I have to eliminate them, but I find it a little bit easier. So let me just real quick show you how easy it is. And she's got a warmer skin tone, so you'd have to actually do a bit of post-processing. Can you face me straight on, just like that? And John, can you pop a reflector underneath yep. her chin for a sec? Great. Let me take one quick test. Okay, so for an example like this, this would be for a shot where I'm going for bright, glowing, happy because there's not shadows, whereas in this, exact opposite. So that's why I say, what's the point of this photo? Um, for that person, what I do is in the, de the develop module of Lightroom, I go down to hue saturation luminance, I desaturate reds, yellows, and oranges, and then I brighten up in luminance. I lighten up reds, yellows, and oranges. And obviously that's like to a ex super extreme, but it's just to prove the point kind of side by side. I can go really pale and it looks more ex overexposed on maybe there, something like that. Um, it still works with shadows, but I find it just to be a little bit smoother when you have a low contrast versus a high contrast image. Cool. Okay. Is there an ideal distance for placing your subject away from the background in the studio? Okay, good question. I recommend that you keep them as far away as you can because what you usually want to do is you want to light in different zones, like different planes. And the closer the subject is, it makes it very difficult because this light is going to be spilling on the background. So if I want my background really dark, all of a sudden when they're very close, I have to consider the way I angle my light to see if the background will go dark, or the way I position it, or I've got to take um, a flag to block off the light. The further back I bring from the background, it separates the two, so one's not influencing the other. Same thing is if I have this background and I take two zoom reflectors, one on either side, and I try to light that background white, I've got to give it quite a bit of light to make it pure white. And what ends up happening is it ends up kind of hazing around, it ends up bouncing, and it ends up giving her rim lights that maybe I didn't want. If I could pull her away, I can light those two separately. The background won't influence her, she won't influ influence the background. Um, in small spaces, all of this is absolutely possible. It's just, as with anything, you know, if you, if you got lots of money in a big space, things are easier, right? <laughs>